In this segment, we are going to deal with the topic of being born again. I guess you could call it the Mount Everest of topics. It's also known as regeneration in the Bible. You must be born again. Um, we're going to be looking at aspects of being born again. It's necessity, that it's mysterious, that it's just the beginning, uh, the instantaneous nature of being born again, and the sovereign nature of being born again. Recently, a woman said to me that she was a Christian, but she didn't want to be one of those born-again type Christians. Um, you've probably have heard similar comments from people, and I will return to that. But in the meantime, just wanted to say, and speaking about the necessity of um, being born again, that... Our first point is the absolute, total, utter, entire, unqualified, sheer, thoroughgoing need for being born again to enter the kingdom. Did I say that one needs to be born again? <laughs> okay. Jesus makes it very clear that we must be born again. And the classic text for that is John chapter 3. So let's read from that. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless you, you that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Stop there. <clears throat> I think it would be appropriate if I read also from um, Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of, of flesh. Give you a heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And then from uh, Deuteronomy. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, that you may live. This is the kind of thing that uh, Nicodemus would have known. You know, I can't think of a, a topic in the Bible that's more important 
than what we're discussing tonight, being born again. In our series on systematic theology and the complex of events that surround salvation, it, it is amazingly rich and complex, all the things going on simultaneously, but in some way are distinct. <clears throat> we looked at the effectual call last time, and now we're looking at the rebirth, being born again, or regeneration. And next time, um, we'll be looking at faith in Christ, and then justification, and adoption after that. But do you realize that though those are those three or four things are distinct, they all occur at the same time? One has to occur logically before the other. For example, you have to believe before you're justified. You not justify before you believe. But virtually at the same time, you have four or five things going on. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when you think of all the blessings that flow to us because of our union with Christ, um, but let's look at um, John 3. In verse 1, it says that a man named Nicodemus um, is uh, brought into, into the picture and introduced to us. And we see two things about him immediately. It says he's a Pharisee and that he's a ruler of the Jews. Now, the Pharisees started off well. They were fastidious in their law-keeping, and at the time of Jesus, there were about 6,000 of them, probably. They were the Bible-believing Jews of their day. They were the real um, Orthodox believers. <clears throat> they had separated themselves from the corrupting influences of the world. Um, it had obviously degenerated into a horrible legalism, as we see in the Gospels. Um, but they were seen by the, the population as the group who were zealous for the law. And, um, but it also says that, that Nicodemus was a ruler of, the, ruler of the Jews, meaning that he was part of the Sanhedrin which was made up of 70 men that ruled over the nation of Israel. So he was a deeply religious, extremely educated man, and very well respected and influential. Um, verse 10 says that he was the teacher in Israel. And we're also told um, elsewhere that uh, he was wealthy. wealthy. Um, the Sanhedrin, the ruling body that oversaw the religious life of, the, of Israel, it was like the Supreme Court. So he was part of the spiritual elite, the seals of the spirit. <laughs> um, when you... Th th Try to think of it in, in modern day terms, it would be like Nicodemus would be like a combination of a seminary professor and a senator from your state, or maybe a, a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church and a um, someone in parliament in England. Um, he was just a, he was a teacher of teachers. So folks would have looked at Nicodemus as the paradigm of piety and a highly respected man whom everyone showed deference and respect to. And if anybody had it together spiritually, it would have been him. But it seems that he had something on his mind. He was concerned about something. It may have been the status of his soul. He comes at night to Jesus, 
And everybody says it's because he wanted to be dis discreet, and I suppose that's, that's a proper inference, um, particularly given John's stress on darkness and light in his gospel. But anyway, um, one can see, at least at this point, early in the ministry, where <clears throat> he had a genuine, sincere interest in, in where Jesus who he was. He wanted to find out who this upstart uh, teacher was, um, but he didn't want him to be seen with him and during the day. So we have Nick at night. <laughs> he addresses Jesus, as hum he, Jesus humbly and politely. He, this teacher of teacher calls Jesus rabbi or teacher. That's noble. It really is. This teacher of teachers is calling Jesus teacher. Even though Jesus had no formal training, no seminary degree, no PhD by his name or anything like that. And um, then like today, um, ministers tend to look at their uh, pedigree, uh, other other people's pedigrees to, to check them out to see if they're up to snuff. But here is this powerful man calling Jesus rabbi or teacher. And he further makes a sound observation, which I think we can learn from. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. We know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. There's two things I want to say about that. Um, first, Jesus was not a teacher from God. Jesus was God who was sent to teach. But secondly, um, his comment about... Um, him coming from God. Nobody could do these miracles unless God made them. Um, Nicodemus saw the miracles as well as the integrity of Christ's life. And he had to rationally conclude that he was from God. But as you may sadly recall, his assessment of Jesus is quite different from uh, his uh, colleagues who said that um, Jesus' um, ability to be able to um, do miracles was uh, from Satan, which is a horrible, horrible thing to say. So Nicodemus shows not just restraint, but pride. Um, he certainly shows some sound logic and reasoning, which, again, I think today we can learn from. Logic should guide our beliefs. And the only sound reason to believe anything is if it's true. And um, that seems to be the principle that he's, he's working by. Okay, so how did Jesus reply to these compliments of by this very influential leader. Now remember, Nicodemus hadn't even asked a question, but Jesus knew his heart. And if you look back in chapter 5, verse 25, it said that Jesus did not entrust himself to anyone because he knew what was in the heart of a man. But anyway, how did Jesus reply to uh Nick at night's um, compliments. Did he say, ah, gosh, golly, I'm speechless, Dr. Nicodemus, especially coming from you. I'm flattered by your compliments. Now, it's almost as if Jesus couldn't wait until Nic Nicodemus stopped complimenting him and all the fluff so he could he could he could speak as usual jesus cuts through the social protocol and gets straight to the heart because as as god 
he knew what was on Nicodemus's mind. In verses three through five, speaking to to one of the top drawer, if not the top drawer theologian of his day, this cardinal congressman, Jesus says, "Truly, truly, I say it to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God." Now, if anyone during that day would people would have thought was already born again or didn't need to be born again, it would have been him. Now, I need to remind everybody, it was not Billy Graham, it was not Billy Sunday, it was not Jonathan Edwards, it was not John Wesley who invented the phrase, you must be born again. It was Jesus of Nazareth who said that you must be nece- you must be born again. <clears throat> Jesus is the one who said it. <clears throat> and he said that you cannot see the kingdom of heaven or of God unless you are born again. There's an absolute necessity. Jesus is introducing a necessary condition for entry for both seeing and entering into the kingdom. Now, a necessary condition is something that goes like this in logic. A must happen if B is to follow. It is absolutely necessary. That is, if someone is to go to heaven, or enter into the kingdom, A A must happen first, and that is they must be born again. It is fundamentally and absolutely necessary being born again is. I, I have heard, and I'm sure you have too, people say that they are Christians, but they don't I like born again types. Now they may be Christians, and what they're talking about is is folks who who have different personalities, who are just um, maybe not very sensitive in the way that they uh, express their evangelistic uh, styles or that sort of thing, but. The, the statement itself is truly misguided because, friends, if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. In fact, saying born again Christian is a redundancy. It's kind of like saying Christian Christian. Born again Christian is like a form of theological stuttering. There's no such thing as a non-born-again Christian or a born-again non-Christian. And all who are born again are Christians. It is absolutely necessary to seeing the kingdom. We have Jesus' word on that twice in this segment. And here is the teacher of Israel who should have known this. He should have known what Jesus was talking about. And yet we see in this segment how much he was struggling to follow Jesus' flow of reasoning. But Uh, Nicodemus knew the Old Testament inside and out, and he had to know the teaching of Deuteronomy that I read earlier about being circumcised in heart. He had to know about uh, Ezekiel 36 and about the need for a new heart and about being sprinkled clean and about being spiritually being reborn, which is just a, another way of expressing um, those terms. 
he had to know about Ezekiel 37 and the dry bones being um, coming to life through the, the Ruach. In many other passages in the Old Testament that would have implied um, the depravity of man and the need, the absolute need, for a fundamental change of man's constituent nature <clears throat> that sin had, he knew, he knew that sin wasn't something that was just, with, just at the periphery of human nature. He was very aware of the fact of what we've been talk, talking about, the radical despoilment um, and that sin um, had has caused in the human race. Like Jesus could have said, uh, Nicodemus, you remember Adam and Eve, don't you? <laughs> you remember the imputation of not only the guilt, but also the radical corruption. Doesn't that mean that we need to be born again? My point being is that Nicodemus should have known what Jesus was talking about. It, um, so he's telling the leader, he was telling the leader of Jewish believers, the teacher of teachers of Israel, <clears throat> that he needed to be born again. But in so doing, he's telling all people of all ages that we need to be born again. The absolutely fundamental need for it. And for emphasis, he says, truly Truly, amen, amen. It's the Hebrew way of emphasis. It's kind, of, it's kind of like Jesus saying, now hear this. This is really important. And then he repeats himself to Nicodemus in verse 5. He says, and Jesus answered, truly, truly, again, uh, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm not going to discuss here tonight the, <clears throat> the water and the spirit issue. That's for another time, I suppose. But the fundamental point is, again, he affirmed um, not once but twice the absolute necessity of, of being born again in order to not only enter the kingdom, but just to see it. So here's the bottom line. Unless you are born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God or of heaven. And Americans need to realize that nobody is born a Christian. God has no grandchildren. Yet tons of pastors this Sunday will say to people that they do not have to be born again because they are basically good. I'm not getting down on the um, pastors in general because most of the guys are, are great. And I've been a pastor myself. And But I remember Jonathan Edwards talking about the problem of unregenerate ministers. And it's always been a problem since um, the beginning. Uh, unregenerate pastors and preachers. So... If you have a pastor like that who does not um, teach the necessity of being born again, you have to decide who speaks with ultimate authority. Is it your pastor or Jesus? All true Christian groups believe in the need of regeneration or being born again, but there is difference regarding what that means and when it happens. Reformed theology, which is what I am teaching, what to, in which I embrace, not by upbringing, I was raised Roman Catholic. I embrace re Reformed distinctives by conviction, because I believe, as Spurgeon said, that it's just simply consistent, the most consistent um, expression of biblical Christianity. Now, Reformed theology uh, differs from main, the mainstream view of regeneration or being born again on the timing 
of it. The common view is that faith precedes regeneration or faith precedes being born again or say it again faith brings about being born again but i believe that the bible clearly teaches that regeneration precedes faith all right first point second point regeneration is mysterious First of all, it's necessary. Secondly, it's mysterious. Jesus mentions that just like the wind, which invisibly blows, but has very visible, powerful effects, so the Holy Spirit blows in his work of regeneration. And it's the mysterious operation of the Holy Spirit on dead souls raising them from spiritual death. You may be able to track your conversion process as you look back on it, but the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart is invisible, mysterious. And it's said um, that the Holy Spirit does not leave footprints in the sand. And... Um, you also may have heard this saying, that there is a distinction between the visible and the invisible church. Or in Jesus' Jesus's words, there are wheat and there are tear, tares. Um, but only those born again are in the invisible church, God's elect saints. The visible church is the church that meets on Sunday morning. The invisible church are those true believers who are um, in the midst of those people who are meeting on Sunday morning. Okay. It is necessary. It is mysterious. And regeneration is only the beginning. This is a key point. Regeneration is only the beginning. See, my concern about this topic is that you will confuse regeneration or being born again with the whole process of salvation. In fact, I really believe that in most people's minds, if you ask them what they mean by born again, is pretty much synonymous with being saved. And that's not how I see it. I don't think that's what uh, Jesus is saying um, at all. Um, I don't, I want us to be careful not to confuse regeneration with the whole process of salvation, which occurs after regeneration or being born again. Because then we, do cooperate after that but the same holy spirit who changes our entire inner disposition of heart mind and will during regeneration and does divine surgery in our hearts in being born again enabling us to believe and repent is the same spirit who will fill us after we believe. It's the same Spirit who will baptize us, seal us, sanctify us, and bring us to glorification. So being born again is the beginning of a complex of events which lasts an entire lifetime. And regeneration is the unconscious um, First time where the Holy Spirit, the work of Christ is being applied to a person for the first time before they even profess faith in Christ. It's what enables them to profess faith in Christ. That's why I'm, I'm emphasizing that it's just the beginning. Um, their only beginning, it is comprehensive though. All the effects 
of the radical corruption that we spent so much time talking about are reversed. Like that. That doesn't mean all indwelling sin is taken out right all, um, instantaneously, but there is a radical change of the mind, the heart, and the will. They, they are renewed. The diabolical veil that blinds people is taken off. The scales fall off our eyes. Where we were once blind, now we see. Once we are either deluded by false beliefs or, as many of our friends are, just just disinterested or, you know, as the Bible says, folks hate God. Um, but now, because of regeneration or being born again, the light of Christ's glory shines in our hearts. And 2 Corinthians 4 has a beautiful picture of regeneration. It's where the same power that created the universe shines into the dark recesses of a um, dead soul and shines the beauty of the face of Christ. And that's what awakens the dead soul. The darkness of the mind is enlightened, and we so we uh, move from radical corruption to radical eruption of the expulsive power of new affections. That's what regeneration is all about. So again, we need to be careful to not elevate one kind of conversion testimony over another. Um, I know it's easy to for particularly for folks who have some extraordinary um not rags to riches but from uh, craziness to um sanity type thing testimony to look down on people have who have a more um i guess calm uh testimony where they they can't you know they, they say uh, you know I, I can't even can't even remember when I when I when I haven't believed. You know a radical change happens to some, but others they can't even remember when they um, when they started believing. Um, they were brought up in a Christian home, and so folks with both forms of testimonies need to honor and respect um, that God works in um, different ways with different people. And um, the issue is not whether or not you can remember or so much how you were born again. The issue is, are you born again? And um, not whether or not you can pinpoint the time. That's not really that important. And uh, some people, I think wrongly, do make a, a, a big issue of that, um, trying to pin people down to exactly when they were saved. Well, some people just don't know. They really don't. So again, the question is, are you alive now and not when you were born? So it's mysterious. Um me, you as a whole, is made alive. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, and 2 Corinthians 5, 17, new creation. All right, it, uh, regeneration is also instantaneous. Now, our perception of our own personal conversion process appears to our minds, and what it is, possibly happen over a period of time, weeks, maybe even years. Um, or you may not even be able to remember um, when you were <clears throat> saved. <clears throat> the point is that when God comes to regenerate your heart, it happens in an instant. Okay, It's like that. Now, the process of believing, depending upon who it is, some people spend months and even years searching for the truth. 
And but as far as being born again, that is an instantaneous thing. Okay. And it's often an unconscious thing. <clears throat> The divine physician does not offer dead men several dosages of medicine. Um, he makes a house call and he instantaneously and tenderly invades your soul and performs radical surgery on your soul, taking out the heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh taking out the, the heart that is disinterested in spiritual things and replacing it with a heart that's impassioned for the Lord. And we all know people that are disinterested in the Lord, and we know how... Just I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and how Scripture talks to it, how... Humanly speaking, it is impossible. We have loved ones that we have talked to countless times. We've shared all the evidence in the world. And it, it's like water off a duck's back. People are really lost. And that's why I labored the point over and over and over again was how this lostness affects people's minds as well as their wills. You know, it's not just up to our ability to be able to persuade people. <clears throat> if that were the case, then, you know, we'd be saving people left and right if it was up to us and being able to just th throw out the best evidence that we could. It's, the problem is much deeper than that. It's the heart that needs to be that needs to be open heart surgery on the sinner, and that's what being born again is all about. <clears throat> you know, there is an analogy that some evangelists use um, that I may have mentioned before. Um, it's like a man who was in the hospital. He's deathly ill. He's so weak, all he can do is just lay there. He can't even move his head. Um, and But the doctor comes in and says, if you will just open your mouth, all you can do is just open your mouth, receive this medicine and swallow it, and it will cure you right away. And that's used as an image for um, people coming to the Lord. Problem is this. Have you ever seen a corpse drink medicine? Do you think if you went to the morgue and if you offered it, I'm not being sarcastic, you just, if you went to the morgue, obviously a corpse is not going to drink medicine. The main problem that I see with why people have difficulty accepting some of the reform distinctives is because of a, frankly, I say this gently and humbly, but a deficient view of the utter sinfulness of sin and how the Bible portrays all of its dark ugliness and its savage, comprehensive effects on the entire human um, person. This analogy expresses what is known as prevenient grace, which is the mainstream notion of, of salvation, which is not even taught in Scripture. Um, there might be there might be the idea of that there's ninety nine percent God's grace 
and 1% man's cooperation of effort in being born again in this prevenient grace model that's, that is common, that's mainstream. But remember, flesh, flesh cannot co cooperate at all. That is Jesus' point with Nicodemus, is the contrast of the flesh with the spirit. The flesh must be removed, not cooperated with. We can't woo or persuade that which is dead. So if we're talking about 99% grace of God and 1% man's cooperative effort. That's a lot of grace. But it's not grace alone. It's not grace alone. Jesus says that we have to be born again in order to see and enter the kingdom. And there has to be the work of the Holy Spirit changing the heart of stone to flesh in order to be able to desire to believe. I remind you of the verses John 6, 37 and 44, which talk about how we are unable to come to Jesus unless the Father draws us. And that's a <clears throat> implicit expression of what being born again is, because that's when that desire is implanted in us is that regeneration. We have confused language of being born again with the whole process of salvation. And biblically, being saved, justified, that comes after belief. <clears throat> and um, Acts 16, 14 with Lydia, it was a sovereign work of God's grace in which it says that God opened her heart to listen, to hear, and to understand Paul. And again, I would just remind you on a personal level of how frustrating it is with our loved ones who have no interest at all in the gospel. And it is impossible, utterly impossible uh, on a human level to generate interest in the gospel when there is no interest. And so what is impossible to man is possible with God. And again, I remind you, first, it, it, it doesn't make any sense either. Um, regeneration precedes faith. But in saying that, they're so close in time. All right, it says in Colossians, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. It's talking about Deuteronomy. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. This is the same language as Ephesians 2. Notice what it says when we were born again. And you who were dead in your trespasses, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. When did God make you alive? Now God making you alive, that's synonymous with being born again. Okay? Um, regeneration, uh, that has to do with... Um, born from above as well being made alive quickening those of you who have had women who've had children you know what quickening means feeling the child and does it talk about any cooperation there any wooing any persuasion no it says very clearly here and even more so in in uh, ephesians that it's while we were dead in our trespasses in the uncircumcision of our flesh while we are dead God made us alive 
It's while we were dead that God quickened us. Like that. Okay. There was no no cooperative effort on our part. You know, once the regeneration comes, what happens? A whole lot. But we'll get to that later. Okay, my last point is that regeneration is monergistic. Regeneration is monergistic. I'll explain. The reformers, especially Luther, saw this, that is the monergistic work of regeneration, <clears throat> as the not just as a, a key, but as the main key to the difference between the truth of salvation as it's taught in Scripture versus a Roman Catholic view of salvation. Many people aren't aware of that. But this one phrase, that regeneration is monergistic, the reformer saw that as the fundamental issue that differentiated the truth from the uh, horrible um, heresies of the Roman Catholic um, sacramental uh, view of salvation. Let me explain what monergism means. Okay. <clears throat> It is a sovereign work of grace in the soul before conversion. All right, monergistic versus synergistic. All right, monergistic, the prefix is mono, which means what? One. You have words like monogamy or monotone, like my singing. And then you have it connected with erg. You remember that from junior high? A unit of work. So it literally means one working. In this case, it means God alone working. As opposed to synergistic with the Greek word sun or sin, S Y N. Uh, examples would be words like synthesis, uh, adding something with something else. Uh, syncretism that's adding false belief with the truth so my point is this and it's a fundamental one regeneration or being born again is monergistic sanctification on the other hand is synergistic we it's God and us working together but regeneration we have nothing to do with it. It is God sovereignly coming into our hearts as a divine physician and doing open heart surgery. Not asking our permission, he just does it. He is sovereign and that's what it always boils down to, isn't it? His sovereignty. Jesus uses the imagery of physical birth when he's talking to um, Nicodemus, doesn't he? And it's, he couldn't be clearer um, as far as expressing this truth of monergism. Um, just as you had nothing to do with your physical birth, it happened to you, right? So you had nothing to do with your spiritual rebirth. It happened to you by God. And if it didn't happen to you by God, it never would have happened at all. If it boiled down to the common conception of cooperation, nobody would ever be saved because flesh can only give birth to flesh, as Jesus says. When God raised Lazarus, it was monergistic. He did not say to Lazarus, his corpse, Hey, come on, Lazarus, I need for you to cooperate in the raising of you from your dead state. 
No, Lazarus was helpless and he was hopeless. He was a dead, lifeless corpse, stinking. He did not work with God at all. God did all the raising. He walked after that, but the raising was all of Jesus. Similarly, because of the paralysis of our will due to our radical depravity, and let me back up for a second, Christians who have their wills paralyzed still have the freedom to do what they want to do. The problem is that because of the curvation of the heart inwards, sinners do not want God. We are, by nature, as Scripture says, haters of God. So, because of the paralysis of the will due to our radical depravity, the flesh, we are spiritual corpses. Again, I remind you of Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. We cannot, we cannot cooperate in the initial, in the initial change of the inclination of the heart. Where, where are you going to look to in order to help cooperate? The divine physician comes and does open heart surgery and replaces the heart of stone and with a soft Jesus loving heart, which and this is this is important, which then enables us to believe. Jesus first has to do the surgery, which then enables, gives us the ability, gives us the desire, gives us the passion, the hunger to believe. But remember again, even faith is, is a gift of grace. But it's, it is us believing. So after we are monergistically raised, we believe. We participate in sanctification. But we need divine initiative to quicken our souls to desire to believe. In other words, salvation is from the Lord. Regeneration, or being born again, precedes faith. And I know that's opposite to what mainstream um, evangelicalism teaches. I'm convinced this is the truth, though. Regeneration is the first step, and corpses cannot cooperate. But faith is a fruit. I remind you again, Ephesians 2, why we are still dead. We were made alive. Dear friends, while we were still dead, God made us alive. That is monergistic regeneration. There is, please tell me in the text where you see any wooing, any persuading. There's none. It's God and God alone. And it has to be for this salvation to be grace alone. I have to say this, I do not understand, I don't, how folks do not see this. As I said, I was raised Roman Catholic, so I'm very keen on seeing any elements of Roman Catholicism coming out in a evangelical form, and it grieves my heart to see this, because This is the sovereign work of God, his power of changing your heart, mind, and will. Many people see regeneration as merely moral persuasion by God trying to woo us. But that leaves the choice up to us. And this is an exceedingly shallow understanding of human sin and its effect on the mind, heart, and will. We cannot cooperate because we do not want to cooperate. It takes a radical change of the entire con 
constitution or heart of man. The divine physician makes a house call, and there has to be a substantive change before we will ever make that choice to believe. 99.9% .9 God and 0.01% man is grace. It's a lot of grace, but again, it is not grace alone. That's why I'm so passionate about this, y'all. It really boils down to the issue of grace alone. And I know that you would agree that that's very significant. Now, in closing, I just wanted to give you a, an indisputable um, example of monergistic regeneration, and that is the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, let's stop there, breathing threats and murder, that's pretty heavy. I mean, every breath is, was murderous. Not much there to um, commend himself to God. And remember what the chapter before, he just killed Stephen, was part of it. Okay, he went to the high priest and asked for him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Damascus, excuse me, Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Here you have a man breathing out murder, and he has an encounter with the Holy One, with the Sovereign Son of Man. His enemy, his enemy approached him. Absolutely sovereign conversion of Saul of Tarsus. He intruded his soul and changed him. There was no discussion with Paul. There was no cooperation. God literally knocked him down and changed his murderous heart to a Jesus loving heart like that. And the rest is history. And that, dear friends, is monergistic regeneration in action. Obviously, most cases, thankfully, are not that graphic. But that is a clear case showing what rebirth looks like because it's invisible in how God works. The greatest miracle is a new birth. Greater than water being turned into wine is sinners being turned into saints. By grace alone and to God alone be the glory. Dear Father, thank you for the blessing of being born again and that you reversed all the curse of the fall and have sovereignly tenderly performed surgery on our hearts when we neither wanted it cared for it deserved it but you did it nevertheless and may we be humbled and happy. And um, we praise her, your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.